I just want to uh, say a couple of really important thank yous to all of the sponsors that are making this possible um, tonight and our whole entire Naturals Journey series possible. Uh, so we want to thank our lead sponsor, Hunger Mountain Co-op. We want to thank uh, Onion River Outdoors. We want to thank Greenvest and Capital Coffee and also Union Mutual. And another big thanks to Vermont EPSCOR, which Declan will talk about in a moment, I'm sure. Um, so uh, with that, I will turn things over to Declan. Um, uh, feel free to ask questions as we go in the chat bar um, and we will, I will moderate those questions and I'll, I'll uh, interrupt Declan periodically um, with, uh, with groups of questions that, that you may have. So uh, feel free to communicate with us through the chat bar. And uh, Declan, thank you again very much for joining us. Thank you, Sean, for the opportunity. I, I really do appreciate it. Um, you know, this, this kind of uh, takes the place of some of the outreach that we would have done in person with Vermont EPSCOR. So uh, we usually do a teacher workshop in, in the summertime and um, we couldn't do it, you know, so here we are. So if any of you happen to be teachers, uh, please put that in the chat. Let me know what grade you teach and um, we will inform the powers at, that be at NSF that we have in fact reached out to some teachers. Um, I'm going to focus um, on uh, some of these bugs. Uh, I like the one that was chosen for me by Sean. And um, this is a nice Helgramite we have here. And I'm going to focus on him in a second, or her as the case may be. Um, a lot of this is coming together from some writing I've been doing for The Outside Story, which will end up in a book in the fullness of time. But uh, apparently publishers have uh, supply chain issues with papers. So uh, who knows when that will come out. So let's skip over that. And as, as Sean mentioned, I'm at St. Michael's College. I always forget to do acknowledgements, so I put them at the front. I have to thank a whole bunch of St. Michael's College research students for all of the help that they have given me over the years and allowed me to pursue with them uh, a whole lot of bug stuff. And um, the Vermont F-Score high school groups also, and Janelle Roberge, who's on the chat, um, uh, have allowed me to explore more bugs than I would have reason to otherwise. And um, since I've been writing a little bit about it, I've had a lot of help from Northern Woodlands Magazine editors who are incredible. Um, they told me that, you know, a, a food chain can sometimes be misunderstood as uh, Arby's. And that's a, that's a really good point. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to use some art from Adelaide Tyrol, who is the nat a really an extraordinary natural history artist who's been doing some fabulous illustrations to go along with some of the stuff I'm doing. And I wanted to get a heads up to all the parents out there. Embrace your kid's inner nerd. These are, are my folk, and uh, they have they encourage me to do some of the strange stuff that I do. There's my science fair project, and uh, there's a, a bug stuck on it, on, on, on it since uh, since I was 12, and my spelling was creative and hasn't improved all that much since. But I encourage your kids, um, you'll find that some kids are into the strangest of things, and why not? Let them do it. So I wanted to start off with this bug. This is a Helgramite on the left, and this is one of our biggest predators in terms of length. It's a very, very long bug. Um, these are the gills you can see up, uh, up close here. These little extensions in the side, who knows what those are for? And um, there's various hypotheses about them, but um, since they already have gills, it's unlikely that these things are gills. They must be something else. But these things uh, will crawl out of the river in sometime around July, or early August, and they'll hatch into something like this. And so this, it happens to be a male with these ferocious looking mandibles. And uh, what'll happen is in August, somebody from the maintenance crew or somebody driving by St. Mike's will show up with a yogurt container or something with something scrambling inside. And it's usually one of these unfortunate beasts that's been attracted up to the college by the lights. Um, this is a male, the males have those big uh, spectacular mandibles, um, but they can't really bite you. They're, they're just, you know, they're, they're more um, uh, for, for uh, reproduction and uh, I don't know, maybe they're trying to impress the females. I have no idea. Uh, the females have uh, mandibles that are similar to the nymph stage, and they can actually do a number on you. So watch out for the females with the shorter mandibles, much more practical. Um, they can do some damage. And there's uh, Adelaide's uh, interpretation of the adult. It's kind of fun. So um, they are among many insects that emerge from water. And so one of the prime interactions that people have with insects from the water it's when they come out as adults. And so this wonderful um, Wikimedia life cycle here is of everyone's favorite bug, the mosquito. And uh, there's a few things you need to understand about mosquitoes. Um, their entire life cycle depends on surface tension. And so the adults, uh, many of the species will land on water and lay a raft of eggs. And that raft of eggs needs to float. 
we ordered them up to do experiments in the fall. We can order up rafts of eggs and we hatch them out and we run experiments with the students. These various larval stages are called instars and each one of them has a snorkel and they'll come to the surface and breathe air from the surface. Again, needing surface tension. Um, the re one result of that is many mosquito species can persist in almost any kind of water. So, uh, you know, if you've got a gutter that's slogged, it's a habitat. And the strangest thing about mosquitoes is that the pupae, you think of a pupa, you think of, of, you know, the very hungry caterpillar turning into a chrysalis and it just sits there and it develops. Lots happening inside, but it's very still. But uh, a mosquito pupa actually swims around. And so if you get near a pond that has these pupa, these mosquito, mosquito pupae, they will literally swim away from you. And after they've decided that you're no longer a threat, they'll come back up again. But again, surface tension. And when the adult finally emerges, it balances carefully on the husk of its former self, hauls itself out, springs out all of its legs out of this husk, and can fly immediately from the water surface or walk along. So surface tension, the reason I emphasize that is you don't need a whole bunch of nasty chemicals to kill off your mosquitoes. And you simply need to make sure that if you've got a garden pond, for example, that there's something causing a little bit of wave action on the surface, like a fountain perhaps, or just a bubbler, simple as a bubbler. And you can actually break up the life cycle by breaking up the surface tension. If you have a, uh, oh, a, a drinking bath, a water bath for birds, um, dump it out every once in a while, fill it up again, and you will have disrupted their life cycle. But most aquatic insects are emerging like this at some point. There, there are exceptions. There are things like whirligig beetles where the adults are on top of the water um, and they'll dive and the larvae are under the water. And so they don't really have a typically emergent life cycle, but most, uh, most insects do. And so um, there's a, one thing we did, if you Google um, brainwashed by worms, you'll find about um, a, a, an amazing parasite that lives inside of some of these insects and requires that emergent life cycle because that's how the parasite gets out of the water and um, it's essential. So that those are um, horsehair worms that develop in aquatic insects. They can get into other things like crayfish, but since the crayfish don't come out, they can't complete their life cycle. So mosquitoes, um, let's let Nate back in. All right, um, there's, uh, there's, Adel uh, there's um, Adelaide's wonderful mosquito. So they got the snorkels for breathing, right? And so this is what the, the larva looks like. And this is what they look like when they are um, underwater. And there's a pupa right in the middle. You can see all the snorkels sticking up there. Um, I, I, I've stolen images from all over the place here and I've given credit when I remember to. There's a, an organization, I, I've called it NABS. It used to be called the North American Association of uh, Dentological Science. And now they've changed it to freshwater science. I kind of like NABS. Anyway, on we go. So rain gutters are places where um, your aquatic insects will be living happily not just mosquitoes, there'll be midges and other things living in there. So it is actually worth unplugging your gutters once in a while. Um, as far as uh, the mosquitoes are concerned, it's an ideal habitat, really close to a food source, which would be you or me. So uh, yeah, get your, get your gutters cleaned up. Here's something else with a snorkel. So this is a water scorpion and um, they are not, you know, they don't sting you at all. The, the tail structure, which is what gives them their name, is actually their snorkel. So they will back up to the surface and take a breath of air. And they have an amazing structure underneath called a plasteron. And it is a water repellent structure that allows them to trap a bubble of air directly next to their abdomen. And from that air, they can extract oxygen, which sounds good so far. But what happens when they can't get their snorkel up to the surface and there's ice on top and they are completely entombed? Um, the, the bubble can continue to function as what they call a physical gill. And what they mean by that is when the organism extracts oxygen from the bubble, right? The oxygen concentration in the bubble gets so low that the, the, the relative concentration relative to what's in the water is favorable. And by that, I mean, there's more oxygen in the water than in the bubble and oxygen will diffuse into a largely nitrogen bubble from where the insect can actually use it. So there's, there's a whole lot of fascinating things going on with these funnels. And they will sit there um, very, very patiently and wait until something swims by and they've got their front legs waiting to grab hold of it. And they are predators, so they'll grab whatever has swum by, including things as large as fish and amphibians, 
and they will pierce the skin with their mouth parts, inject digestive enzymes and suck out the contents like a straw. So they're uh, a little terrifying. <laughs> um, and uh, I wanted to point out this resource. Um, a lot of people write these articles. It's called The Outside Story. Um, somebody writes one every week. Once in a while, it's me. Um, but um, whatever the topic is, terrestrial or aquatic, you can probably find something of interest to share um, in the outside story. So I encourage you to go for that. They've been great. Other things living on top, these are the whirligig beetles that you may have seen. And um, whirligig beetles are incredibly well adapted for what they do. Um, this is what the back legs look like. They've got their, 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 they're a beetle, right? But their legs, instead of being beetle-like, are flattened out like a paddle. And they look like a little deranged motorboat going around with no rudder. They're going in circles and loops and um, it's very distracting to predators who might want to come and grab one. And the other thing is that, they, you know, it's a trade-off between advertising your presence and hiding your presence. Um, they, they are distasteful. And when things are distasteful, they tend to occur either brightly colored or in large groups. And the larger the group, the more they advertise that distastefulness, which is kind of cool. But they also uh, can dive to escape. If somebody is not turned off by that, they'll go ahead and dive. And here's what they look like from the side. And there's a number of cool features here. They have counter shading, which a whole bunch of organisms have where you've got dark on top, which means if you're viewed from above, you're somewhat camouflaged with a dark bottom. If you're viewed from below, you're somewhat paler against a pale sky. And uh, so that, that's, that's one cool adaptation. You can kind of see what would be below the water. But if you look up front, they've got something that's even more remarkable. They've got, this is one side of the organism. You can see two eyes there and there's two eyes on the other side as well. So they're one of the few things in the insect world that have four eyes, two looking up, two looking down. The microstructure on the surface of this eye is different from the microsurface below. Um, a study out of China in the last year, um, or last two years, um, looked at that. So they're, they're, they're pretty amazing little beasties. Um, I really, uh, really enjoy working with them. Um, something else you'll see on the surface, you'll see these, um, these are um, uh, fishing spiders. So this is the dark fishing spider, and it happens to be on my trail camera, um, which I, this is a cell phone photograph that I took about two weeks ago. Um, they're probably the most impressive spider you're going to see in Vermont. I, I probably should have done a trigger warning. Um, <laughs> but they, they literally will hang out with their back legs on the vegetation at the side of, of a river. And their front legs are in the water feeling for vibrations. And they'll run out across the surface. And despite the fact that they call them fishing spiders, they don't frequently eat fish. There was a study done in Ontario and they had some 600 observations and I don't think there was a single fish. There was one, um, there was one uh, tadpole of some kind. I don't remember what species, but uh, most of what they were eating were water striders, which I'll talk about in a second. So these, these are amazing. Here's another species. This one is the six spotted um, water, water uh, fishing spider. And they tend to be more on ponds if you count the spots at the back end, you'll find that there's a lot more than six. It turns out that the spots are underneath, that when there are six spots underneath, but um, you can tell, you know, some entomologist uh, named the thing because nobody gets to see the ones underneath unless it's the last thing you see when they come to eat you. <laughs> so that's the six spotted water strider, uh, water spider. And um, I wanted to move on to water striders. So if you've seen this shadow, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you've ever been near a pond, you see those shadows. You usually see the shadows before you see the, the, the insect because the shadows are so much bigger. So this is the insect and they have these incredibly long legs and they're hydrophobic hairs at the end. I'll show you pictures of that in a second. And their front legs are raptorial, meaning that they'll reach out to grab things. And um, in the center, if you think of the front legs as arms, imagine if in the center of your palm, you had a single uh, fingernail pointing down that's how they grab things. So you've got these, these amazing hands, so to speak, with a spike on each one and you grab something and then you can use your piercing mouth parts to, to do the rest. Um, so there's a nice shot from Wikimedia um, looking at how they you know, indent the water surface, which creates these huge shadows that we see. And here is one taken by one of our students, um, Aaron Hispontius took this photograph of the hydrophobic hairs on the end of the um, of the leg. 
So uh, she was actually a UVM student at the Motor Work at St. Mike's and Aquatic Bugs and did some amazing photography while she was there. So how are we going to get there? So you need a net of some kind. So this net I'll show you in a second. This, this net is, is a quite a large net. It's 18 inches across. And this is sort of the standard sampling net if you're trying to do this um, for the purposes of research. And we do what are called kick samples. And you get large rocks that you might have in your, uh, in your stream bed. This is in the floor of the stream, pressed down against the floor of the, of the stream bed. And you're going to take any rocks that are there and scrub them right there so that the water is moving through. And all of the insects that you disrupt are washed right into the net. And then once the big rocks are gone, um, that would be, you know, for any geologists out there, these would be cobbles and boulders. Um, but uh, the likes of me call them rocks. Um, uh, you give it to the big things and then you disrupt the gravel that's underneath and kick around and get things moving. And you'll see the water turn brown and you flow it through the net and you have gotten your bugs. Okay, so let me get out of this for a second. And I'm going to stop sharing the screen and I'm going to just show you uh, some of the equipment. So um, if, you, if you have the option to click your zoom onto speaker view, you'll see me a little bigger if, if you really want to. So this, this is what that net looks like. So I just want to emphasize the scale. That's a big sampling net. If you're trying to do standardized sampling, that's what you need. If you're not trying to do standardized sampling, there's a much more practical net. Um, this is a D-frame net. Um, you really want a net that's got a straight edge on it. And that's why we emphasize D-frame. And you can get that against a stream bed more readily than a circular net. Um, so these are great for sampling in around weeds, or great for sampling stream beds, um, you know, those kinds of things. So a very, very rugged net. This one is older than most of my students, and you can replace the bag if you need to. So, you know, if you're going to do this long term, spend 150 bucks and get the net. Um, if you are doing it for the afternoon, by all means, you know, the, the stuff that you can get in the toy store in the summertime by the beach will do fine for the afternoon. Um, you know, they're inexpensive and they work. Um, if you are interested in the things that are flying around, then you need a butterfly net. So I'm not sure if that's practical to be seen there. Um, it's a canvas net with a mesh bag at the bottom. And they're designed to be dry. And you get your thing in there and you, you give it a little twist. And then it's captured because you've closed the front end of the net. So their butterfly nets have their uses. If you're going to do aquatic insects um, that are emerging, Butterfly nets are great for that. But if you want to have an unfair advantage and really get a lot of them, then get yourself an ultraviolet light and a bed sheet. Go over to Spencer Gifts, get yourself a nice black light, a battery powered one, hang it up on a bed sheet. And that is the way to get a whole bunch of caddisflies and other things that are flying around. If you are doing what I call catch and release, if you're teaching or you're doing it with, with some kids or you just want to do it for fun, for maybe you want to make some observations for iNaturalist, um, get yourself this fancy piece of equipment at the dollar store, okay? And your ice cube tray is a perfect little invertebrate zoo. Yeah, you can you can push things, pull things out of the water, put them in there so you can see them, put them in the shade so they don't overheat, and release them at the end of the day. Um, I usually take my net, turn it inside out into a basin of some kind, and my favorite basin is a cat litter tray. A cat litter tray um, is nice and shallow, and allows you to really um, get what you need without um, having to um, spend a fortune. Um, I use this additional fancy piece of gear called a turkey baster, and they even make them smaller than this. This is great when you see um, things like mayflies will tend to swim in the water, even if you've taken them out of a stream, they'll swim in the water in your basin and they're hard to pick up. Um, a, tur a, a turkey baster allows you to just suck them up one at a time and squirt them into your, into your invertebrate zoo. Another approach to getting things out of the water is to have a sieve. So when I'm doing my sampling, I use this. And this is a 0.6 millimeter sieve, which is a standard the state of Vermont uses. So that's what we use for scientific purposes. But that's a $50 item. And you have to ask yourself, do I want to spend $50 when I could get an embroidery hoop and stick a piece of window screen in there and I'm in business. I would encourage you to get the nylon window screen, not the metal one, because the metal one's going to give you scratchy edges. And if you're working with six and seven year olds, which we sometimes do, um, you don't want to be giving them scratchy, pokey things. Better to have a nylon window screen. So that is a, a Joanne's fabric item. Um, not that they're giving me commission or anything. Um, 
I encourage you to get the plastic ones rather than those nice bamboo ones that you might use for hanging up something nice in the wall. Plastic ones last forever. Um, if you are really getting into making nets, you want to get serious about it. Um, when I was a kid, we called this bull wire. I'm not from around here, so I don't know what, what, what you might call it. But um, what Home Depot calls it is multi-purpose galvanized wire. This is a 50 foot roll. Great for making a bunch of nets and not that expensive. And, and then for your fabric, you can make a decision whether you want to go for canvas, um, a couple of layers of something called bridal veil netting, which is another one of those things you can stitch in and make a very large mesh net. Um, but I would, I would suggest canvas and some nylon window screen would be a nice combination for a durable net. Um, forceps, you can go to the pharmacy and get tweezers, um, or you can buy forceps. You can get them on Amazon, just Google forceps, and you get all kinds of good things. So. Uh, before I turn the slides back on, uh, I am going to talk about microscopes in a second. Um, uh, and I'm going to just show you, uh, this is what I use for illuminating microscopes in the field. This is just a, a, a you know, I don't know, dollar fifty uh, LED flashlight. And they're great. Um, if you want to upgrade just a little bit from that, this is a, a nicer flashlight. And I'm going to shine it on the board behind me here. I don't know if you can see that, but you can really focus the beam which is really nice for um, focusing on something under a microscope. And last thing I'll say about it is, uh, you don't want to be holding that while you're trying to focus a microscope and use forceps to move a bug around. You want something that we call in the trade, we, we made this up, flashlight on a stick. And what you do is you get a, a chunk of two by four, about eight inches long, and you put on a little uh, a, a spring clamp that you can buy for $1.50 in the hardware store like you'd use for holding screwdrivers up over your bench, and you clamp, clamp your um, your uh, flashlight into that, and the thing goes onto the wood with one screw, which means you can pivot the, the spring clamp and point it anywhere you want, and you've got yourself the perfect way of illuminating what's under your microscope. So let me just get back onto the slideshow here, and I'll show you what I have in mind from there. Declan, one uh, question. Yes, go so, for it. I'm wondering if you have any ideas for, um, for ways to inexpensively build one of those rugged uh, dip nets that you're showing us. They do get expensive and, and uh, I'm not sure if there's any good way to, to make one. Yeah. Yourself. Well, you know, the, 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 if you, most of the textbook, text, textbooks will say get a coat hanger and um, the coat hanger is good for a few days, but they get very, very wobbly very quickly. And that's why I really urge people to get this wire. Um, you know, a roll of this wire, you know, it's great for a teacher making a dozen nets. This roll, I think, cost me about $12. And I could make many, many nets using this as a frame. And then just, you know, someone handy with a sewing machine can quickly run up um, something, uh, a, a sock-shaped thing to put on there as, as a net. It doesn't have to be too deep. The other thing you can use, um, uh, if, you get a, if you get a large bag of onions um, from the food store, the onion bag is quite a good net in terms of the mesh size for large bugs. So that's another really cheap item if you can get hold of one. And if not, you can go to Joanne's Fabrics and, and get some bridal veil netting <laughs> and some canvas. So lots of, lots of ways to do it, okay? Depends on how, how, how much work you want to put in. And one other item that is, is convenient, if you want to look at plankton, um, what you want to do is get a pair of nylon tights. So, uh, you know, uh, maybe you don't wear tights, but fine, go to the store and buy a pair. It's, it's worth the money. And um, you get two legs out of each pair. So uh, the, the, the top end, the thigh end, if you like, uh, you would put around your coat hanger or around that nylon, not around that, that uh, wire. And um, you then uh, cut off the foot entirely and put something in the foot, like a baby food jar or a small vial, for example, like this. And you can rubber band it in there. So you've cut the foot off and this goes in where the foot used to be and the rubber band is going to hold it in there. And so then you just pour buckets of water through the, the, the thigh end of the, uh, of the, uh, the tights and um, the, um, the plankton will get caught and concentrated in your bottle at the end, which could be a baby food jar. Those baby food jars are great. Make friends with your local daycare provider or your local uh, parent of small children. Um, I just lost my vial here somewhere. <laughs> All right. Enough about vials, I guess. Um, let me go back over to the slides here. Uh, where is my screen? 
Are we seeing slides? Judy, are you the only person I can see? Judy, do you see slides? All right. Thank you. Hi, Judy. How you doing? <laughs> Good to see you. Ju Judy was uh, an adjunct at St. Mike's um, at, at one time. So welcome back. If folks have any questions, go ahead and throw them in the chat bar. And you're welcome to turn on your video so that uh, Declan can actually see you. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I promise not to, not to tell people uh, what you have hidden behind you. So I hit all that. Uh, microscopes. So, okay, every toy store in the country sells very inexpensive plastic uh, compound microscopes, and they are usually garbage. Um, so you want to avoid compound microscopes, um, particularly the, the toy store variety, because really they are just an exercise in frustration. Um, if you're going to get a compound microscope because you want to look at plankton or you want to look at pollen or you want to look at hairs or feathers or something cool like that, by all means, but you're going to have to spend some money and get a good one. The, the plastic lenses in the toy store and, and the battery powered lights are terrible. So what you want for looking at, at bug sized things, I, I think of them as penny sized things and up. You want what's called a dissecting microscope or a stereoscopic microscope. Um, they don't tell, tend to sell them in the, in the toy stores, but they are literally what every kid needs as distinct from a compound microscope. So they're lower magnification, so you can see big things. Kid likes, kids like to look at their fingers. They'll spend, the, you know, they want to see their fingerprints. They can see them. They've got a thorn in their finger. They might want to see how to get it out, right? Um, but they'd like to see, you know, things are, that are larger and easier on the imagination and easier, a much better start. So I'd say get yourself a, comp a compound mi a dissecting microscope and they use reflected light. So the light is not shining up from the bottom. And um, if you have the light shining from the bottom and you're looking at a, a solid insect, the light's not going to go through the insect. So you end up with a black silhouette and it's fine for what it is, but you're, yeah, it's better to have reflected light. So if you get onto eBay and search for American Optical 40, you'll find these things that were big in high schools in the 70s and they are rugged and they are hard to kill um, they have some disadvantages if you're going to use them all day it's not the right thing but if you're going to use it for a half an hour on a picnic table with a flashlight it's perfect so very very simple to use we have a bunch of them with EPSCOR and we lend them out sometimes and we uh, bring them out for programs and we can put them onto a picnic table and literally use them in the field so that's, that's what I'd suggest for a microscope for starting um, if you want to get all fancy uh, you can get onto eBay and you can spend 300, 400, 500 bucks on a Veeld M5. Those things are beautiful. That's what I have in my lab. And every time I see one on eBay, I'm, I'm watch watching the prices. <laughs> so I think I'm up to four at this point. I might be done. So what are you going to get? So there's all kinds of things you can get. Um, there's all of these various bugs. There's, there's a, a nest spinning caddisfly in there. There's a flat-headed mayfly, some black flies. All of these things you can get in Vermont streams readily. And there's another type of caddisfly, there's a different net spinner down there. Um, there is something called um, macroinvertebrates.org. And this is something put together by the Stroud Water Research Lab in Pennsylvania. And um, they have an online photographic key, which is hard to beat. Um, it really is uh, impressive. And they've covered all of the common things that you're likely to find um, you know, the, the alternatives for identifying bugs run from this type of resource, which I, I highly recommend. If you're someone who's going to be, uh, you know, I'm not going to turn the screen off for this, but if you're someone who's going to do it uh, for your work, you're going to end up with something like this. A fabulous resource is called An Introduction to the Aquatic Insects of North America um, by Merritt Cummins and Berg. And, you know, this introduction runs to 1470 some pages right so you'll be well introduced if that's what you're going to use um on the other hand if you're going to be an occasional uh, you know the same way that i've got a bird book and i've got a i've got a, a wildflower guide you can get something like this this is um a guide to the freshwater invertebrates of north america by reese voshaw i like this one because it covers insects but it also covers the other things you're going to find like crayfish you're going to find other invertebrates that are not insects. So um, the other thing I like about it is it comes, you can, you can buy flashcards published by the same people and they are really beautifully uh, illustrated um, pieces of art that uh, allow you to look at things very, very quickly. They're printed on a waterproof plastic and uh, they're great. So if you're going to buy the, uh, the, uh, the guide from um, Fauchel, 
Uh, remember to order, order the flashcards as well. So, why? Why are we doing stream bugs? Aside from the fact that they're just cool, um, the first thing is that they are very sensitive to changes in water quality. And so they are the, the, the canary in the coal mine, so to speak. And the canaries were brought in because they would suffocate before the, the miners did and give the miners some warning. So, question coming? What does it mean to you uh, when you hear the term Declan. Oh, I'm muted now. <laughs> there you go. Sorry about that, Declan. Ah, that's all right. I wasn't saying anything important anyway. So, uh, so the stream invertebrates are essentially um, the indicators of the health of a stream. Um, so here's Anne, one of my students, taking some samples in, in a stream in, in, in Vermont, and she is assessing the, the, the health of that stream. Um, the reason that the bugs are so sensitive is not only the water quality, but also the physical structure in the stream. When, um, when, when riverbanks and when soil gets eroded, um, a lot of particles are deposited into the stream. And it's a lot like um, if um, SD Ireland was to back up their concrete truck to your house and stick the chute in the window and unload, it wouldn't be very good for your living conditions. And the same is true when all of the little nooks and crannies between the rocks in a stream fill up with particles. Those nooks and crannies are where things live. There you go, choice two. I think I'm seeing the pattern here. Okay, I think I figured this out. Good. Onward. So, uh, there we go. Healthy streams. Um, you're going to get things like this. You're going to get stoneflies. You're going to get some dragonflies in the pools. You'll get a range of true flies, dipterans. You'll get, uh, this is a, a nice view of the dragonflies mask. I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. You'll get water pennies and you'll get some uh, variety of caddisflies and you'll get mayflies and lots of other things. The healthier the stream, the more diversity you're gonna get. I stole these slides from Janelle Roberge, who's on the chat here. Um, and the unhealthy streams will also have some caddisflies. This is a net spinning caddisfly and they just love filthy streams because they eat particles. So you'll see them in agricultural streams and you'll see them in urban streams. So um, it's it, the diversity of caddisflies is what matters. Um, but you'll see um, the unhealthy streams dominated by midges, by worms, by snails sometimes, by bloodworms, which are a, um, they're another variety of midge that has hemoglobin right on its surface. And they can extract tiny amounts of oxygen from the nastiest of streams and ponds and, and the floor of Lake Champlain. So uh, if that's all you're seeing, you've got a pretty unhealthy stream. To really look at the big picture, you want to look at the number of species. This is the last data slide I'm going to show you, I promise. But on the vertical axis, I have the number of species in three categories that I'm going to talk about in a second. And over here, I have the proportion of agricultural and urban land use. And what you'll see is, as the uh, essentially, as you get away from forested watersheds and you get into more either agricultural or urban, you end up with fewer and fewer and fewer species. species. This is Centennial Brook which is something that drains um, the parking lots of what used to be the Sheridan Hotel, I've no idea what it is now, and UVM, right? So that's right in Burlington. This is Snipe Island Brook out in Richmond, which is almost entirely forested. So uh, lots of, you know, approaching 30 species in, in a forested stream, getting down to four, five, and six in a very urban stream. So you get the idea. This is why we do what we do. Um, those three letters, EPT, refer to three groups, Ephemeroptera, which is the mayflies, Plecoptera, stoneflies, Trichoptera, caddisflies. I'm going to hit each of those groups now. So, mayflies. The mayflies are quickly distinguished by having three tails at the back end, except when they've got two, but that's fairly rare. Most of them actually have three, okay? Um, uh, if you're under the microscope, one claw at the front end. You don't necessarily need a microscope. This is something you could see with a good magnifying glass. And there's oh, one really important tip for everybody. You want to look at small things efficiently these days. Get your cell phone and spend $18 on a clip-on macro lens. And they'll come from wherever they come from, Amazon or wherever. Look at the delivery date because there's two companies out there. One of them has six-week delivery time. The other one's about 10 days. So they're $17, $18. 
clip right onto your, they just literally spring clip onto the front of your phone and suddenly you've got yourself a microscope in your hand. Best thing I've seen in a while. I've had so much fun this summer, one of those. You could see the claws on a mayfly with that device. Very, very inexpensive. Um, so uh, that's what they look like when they're growing up. They, the wings are held vertically. They're named originally for a species in, uh, in England that occurred in May. But there are mayflies that hatch, you know, March, April, May, all the way through the season until it gets too cold for them. Okay, so those are the mayflies. And like I said, they hold their wings vertically side by side like this. All right. Uh, next ones are stoneflies, Plecoptera. They're called stoneflies because they were believed to hatch from stones from people who never bothered to stick a net in the water to see where the nymphs were. So uh, they do climb up onto stones and then they, the back splits open and out comes a stonefly. So they tend to have two, they always have, sorry, not tend, they always have two tails at the back end. So they're very, very reliable. When you look at mayflies and stoneflies for a while, you'll see that the, the stoneflies have a very much more rugged, robust kind of a gestalt than the more slender mayflies. So you won't even be looking at the tails after you've looked at these for about two or three weeks. You'll be like, ah, okay, it's a stonefly, I don't need to count tails. But they do have two tails and they do have two claws at the end of each foot. Um, so these, these ones here are giant stoneflies and they're eating an important food resource in the stream. Um, right now, as we think of leaf season um, that we're going through and we're looking at these beautiful leaves, it's just the beginning of the leaf season in the rivers because all of those leaves that are blowing across the landscape, as soon as they hit a watery surface, they get wet and they sink and they provide the food base for most of our streams that are small streams in particular, on up to the, even up to the size of the Minuski River, um, the food base falls in and is established now. So you need a diverse community of trees to sustain all of these insects and invertebrates in the stream. Cool thing about it, some things like um, linden, for example, they'll, those leaves will fall in and they're very, 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 very light duty leaves. They quickly are colonized by fungi and they become edible fairly quickly. Other things like oak, for example, and beech are much more leathery and they keep their tannins and they keep some of the toxins that they used to ward off herbivores. And those things take a much longer time to soak and process. It's called conditioning. So that's a food resource that becomes available much later in the season. So if you've got a diversity of trees, all of those different leaves falling in at different times, all having different physical structures, all having different chemical makeups, allow for a continuous food source that goes through the whole season and even into the beginnings of early summer. So you will still find decomposing leaves in a stream in the beginning of summer. And then by the time it's run out, it gets replenished because we could fall back again. So leaves are a huge resource and eaten by things we call shredders, categories of bugs called shredders, <clears throat> including some stoneflies. The adult stoneflies have wings that are held flat and very, very obviously different than mayflies. There's one my daughter photographed this past weekend up at the um, Snowflake Bentley Museum. There's a nice stream that flows down the back there. Um, so yeah, she was having fun with her camera. And I just love the, the, the colors on these folks. You can see the, the gills on this one also. So this is a perlid stonefly, family is perlidae. All right, um, this might look like a, a little blurry snail, not the best photograph in the world. Here's a better photograph. You can still see the snail structure, but you can see that it's not a snail. It's got six legs sticking out here. This is actually a caddisfly. <clears throat> so this is the, uh, the T group, Trichoptera. This one uh, also happens to have little black chips that it incorporated into this case. So the case is made entirely out of sand grains and some of these sand grains are magnetite, which is really cool because when you put your forceps into the sample and stir it around, out come the caddisflies magnetically attracted. And um, this came out of the La Platte River down in Charlotte. Um, they, are, they only coil in one direction, which is kind of fascinating. Somebody went through the Royal Ontario Museum collection and they all coiled in the same direction. Um, I have yet to find one go the other way, but someday maybe I will. Um, so the trichoptera, the caddisflies, many of them build cases and some of them build nets. They all have silk and the adults all have hairy wings. Um, the larvae always have what we call anal claws, so a pair of claws at the back end. Here's a photograph of one um, up close in person. You see those cool teeth. Great for identifying them. You, you know, that's when you do need your, your more powerful microscope. 
So as I said, who knows? Oh yeah, there's those about the adults. The adults are little hairy moth-like beasties. And if you live near a water body and turn your light on at night, they'll come to your porch light and you can see all the, the, the caddis flies you want. Um, sometimes they're medically important because people get allergic to them, usually entomologists. All right, <clears throat> this is, uh, looks like a, a mossy rock, right? It is. Um, what I want you to see is there's a place here where there's no moss growing. And in that place, there's these little silk things. And each of these is a silk case of a caddis fly, okay? And this is what the, the diagram looks like. Um, uh, they have this large swelling at the back end. And I think of this as their waist. And this determines how far out they can reach, okay? So, you know, how, how far can they go? It gardens. The reason there's no moss where they were is not because they ate the moss. People have done studies where they literally lay on their belly with a snorkel and mask on looking at insects. That's a, that's, that can be a, a lifestyle choice for you there, a career path. And what they found is that leukotrichia cuts the moss off at the base and lets it float downstream. And the reason for that is it wants the sunlight reaching the rock so that it can live on the algae and the diatoms that will grow in the absence of shade. And they're very territorial as a result. They fight their own patch and they will, that's why they're, if you look back at that photograph, they tend to be spaced out, particularly where the front entrances are and they don't like to be close to each other. So that's a tricky for you. Um, on to the next group now. So we've covered the E, P and T, which is Ephemeroptera, Plecoptera, Trichoptera. Now we're going to cover some other important groups. This is a Dipteran. Okay, true flies, Diptera. Uh, Diptera refers to two wings, and I'll talk about that in a second. The larvae are maggots, right? And they don't have any legs. And so if you see a larva with no legs whatsoever, no jointed legs, that will be a Dipteran. And then the adults have two wings. So this one is a uh, Tepulidae. So Tepulidae is a family of crane flies. Some people call them daddy long legs flies, which causes drastic confusion because there's at least two other things called daddy long legs. So I prefer to call them crane flies because then everybody knows what the heck I'm talking about. Um, but most insects actually have four wings. So you can count them. There's a butterfly, four wings. There's a dragonfly, four wings. Here is something with two wings, which might land on you and bite you. This is a horsefly, two wings. Generally speaking, if a bug lands on you and bites you, it tends to have two wings. The dipterans tend to be all of our favorites, mosquitoes, horseflies, right? Um, uh, a cool thing is they have this little structure called a halteri, or halteries is the plural, and they, uh, it has been discovered, are balancing devices. They work like a little gyroscope, and uh, <laughs> we know this because someone ran the experiment. They got some flies, they very carefully chopped off the, the, the halteries and they let them fly. And instead of flying straight like they would ordinarily do, they just did this. And so, uh, God, you wonder some of these biologists, what were they thinking? Kind of a, a cruel thing to do to your fly. Um, and also they've genetically modified flies um, to bring back the other pair of wings. So this is a fruit fly that they have modified and its halteries have actually grown a pair of wings when the genes are turned back on again. So there's a, there's a study system for everything, right? <laughs> Everyone loves fruit flies for genetics. All right, the most common bug in any water body is very likely to be a non-biting midge, Chironomidae. So if you've been biking down by Lake Champlain in the summertime and you see these wonderful little clouds of insects going up and down like this, those are very likely to be non-biting midges. And um, there's true romance in the air because um, those are called nuptial flights. And that is basically the singles bar for, uh, for, for uh, chironomids, for non-biting mages. The positive thing is uh, they're not gonna bite you. The, the negative thing is uh, when you're biking through in a hurry, you might get a lungful. So uh, do watch out for those. For some reason, I've seen them uh, form little clouds over the top of fence posts. I don't know if anyone else has ever seen that, but they'll form these little clouds right over the top of a fence post, no idea why. Um, but they do. <laughs> anyway, those are midges and they will be in every water body I have ever sampled. I've yet to find a water body that didn't have some. I get them in pitcher plants in bogs. And that's another purpose for your turkey baster. Get the small size turkey baster because you don't want to damage the pitcher plants. Pitcher plants have two categories of bugs. What I call the happy bugs and the sad bugs. The sad bugs are the things that fell in and are getting digested and providing food for the pitcher plant because it's in a nutrient poor environment. 
the happy bugs are the things that actually move in and live there. And that would include some midges and a, an obscure uh, mosquito called Wyomaya smithi. I'm not even sure what that, what that bites. It doesn't bite people because there aren't enough people in the bogs, but um, it might be biting birds or something else. I don't know. But they're, they literally are you know, specialists living in pitcher plants. Uh, tree holes are another aquatic habitat where things live. So there's, uh, oh yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a midge article for you. All right, <clears throat> non-emergent life cycles. Insects are coming out, going back in again, right? The adults come out, they lay their eggs back in the water. Um, and I, I forgot to mention, there is actually a mosquito species that lays its eggs in dry ponds. So that's the closest you do get to them laying eggs on dry land. And then the pond floods again and the water awakens those eggs. So it's a, quite a remarkable adaptation for temporary water bodies. But non-emergent life cycles, um, these are things that spend their entire uh, life cycle underwater. So this is a crayfish my daughter, again, photographed this weekend. And, uh, you know, the, the, the babies look very much like miniature adults and they go through various stages. Um, uh, an interesting thing, uh, the, the site I found was working with a particular crayfish species. They said it was one day between mating and, and laying eggs. Um, it turns out that that's true for some, I guess, but there are many species for which this can be a protracted period of time. And we had a crayfish at St. Mike's in an aquarium and we had the thing in there for a good dozen months. It was there a full year. And next thing it laid eggs and made babies. And I thought, wow, you know, I was writing the headline already, virgin birth at a Catholic college. I had it all ready to go, but um, we actually did some genetic work on it. And it turns out that um, there was a father involved and with subsequent reading, um, I learned that they can store sperm for a long period of time until they shed their exoskeleton, at which time they need to find another male. But until they've shed their entire exoskeleton, they can store sperm and they can choose when they're going to fertilize the eggs. So it's not like the thing had a 12 month gestation. It's more that it, it decided the conditions were right. And she decided, well, now I'm going to fertilize these eggs and uh, out they came. So. Uh, pretty amazing adaptation. There is one scary crayfish in Europe. It uh, derived from an American species and it spontaneously became parthenogenic. And that is actually a crayfish that can do virgin birth. So uh, the entire species is female. And this is a speciation event that has happened in the last dozen to 20 years. So when people tell you that species don't evolve, well, yeah, they do. And they evolve in our lifetime. And so there is now this parthenogenic crayfish that is moving across Europe because when people put one in their aquarium, which is great, um, they wanted one crayfish in their aquarium. Suddenly the thing has a whole bunch of babies. They don't want them anymore. And they decide it'd be nice to them to chuck them into the nearest river. And so they are hopscotching all the way across Europe through the aquarium trade and uh, they'll be unstoppable. I don't, I don't think there is an educational plan you could put into place that would reach enough people to stop people chucking them out of their aquariums. So they will be in every water body in Europe and all the way across to, to, to Russia <laughs> in the fullness of time. Anyway, uh, invasives, I shouldn't spend too long on invasives. Uh, other non-insects, this is an amphipod. They are a freshwater shrimp. They are flattened side to side. So if you see something with, you know, 10 legs and flatten side to side, you've got yourself a scud. Um, they're very common in Lake Champlain. They're very common in ponds. You'll often see them swimming as a mated pair and they do something called mate guarding and the uh, evolutionary biologists do all kinds of cool studies with them. They're a wonderful little organism, easy to keep in an aquarium too. Um, so I talked about food. I talked about leaves. In rivers where the canopy opens up, get a little bit bigger, you've got light coming in you get a certain amount of algae growing in those streams. And so that is where we got our scrapers. Okay, <clears throat> and so this is called a false water penny. It has this kind of bread knife edge to it. This is actually a beetle larva and uh, it's not quite circular. So you know you get a false water penny. And then the true water penny is much more circular. It doesn't have that bread knife edge and it has gills underneath. When this was first described, it was described as a decapod. So uh, it was described in the 1800s by somebody who had never seen the adult. I was studying aquatic insects and streams for a dozen years before I ever saw an adult. So I think I, we can forgive the person who thought this thing might've been a decapod. It wasn't like he miscounted the legs. 
in the description it literally says legs three pairs <laughs> so uh you know but you know it, in every other way it looks like a decapod it does not look like an insect aside from the fact that it's got six legs the the adults are very ephemeral and um, it's a very very brief pupation very very brief adult phase phase and then you're, you've got you know eggs and then larvae again so but you'll get these in in many many rivers around the place uh particles other things that things eat in the stream we get particles particles are most important in the biggest rivers so think mississippi mud right think about all of the churning and all of the stuff that is has washed into a large river and the fact that the current is moving rapidly and keeps it in suspension that's where the particles are most important but you also get particles in agricultural streams in um, in urban streams so there are filtering collectors that will eat that stuff so let's talk about everyone's favorite filtering collector this is a black fly and if you look up close and personal at a black fly's head they have these uh, hand-like structures so like I said dipteran larvae this is a true fly two, uh, two wings they don't have any legs but they needed something for grabbing things out of the water column and so the antennae evolved into this grasping structure. If you get one under the microscope, okay, even if the thing has been pickled for 10 years, squeeze that head capsule, this is the head capsule, squeeze the head capsule gently with forceps and it will open and close its, uh, its filtering parts, which I think is a, it's always a cool trick to do with students. Right? Um, years ago and... Okay, we're moving on. Does that mean I'm muted too? No, I'm, I'm still going. All right. Uh, another filtering collector. This is a, uh, a caddis fly. And um, this is a net spinning caddis fly. Very, very common. And these are the ones that really like uh, uh, filthy water, essentially. Um, that's what it looks like up close and personal. And if you look, this is a photograph taken just through the water on uh, a rock surface on the La Platte River. Each of these little C-shaped structures here is the opening in a caddis fly net. And there's been some studies done where they'll, they've um, done aquarium studies where they will introduce and take away these, these caddis flies and the silk structure actually holds the gravel together and reduces the amount of erosion that happens. They're pretty amazing. But they're also cleaning the water because water's flowing through here and they're removing particles. Also in this picture is a little rectangular structures, another caddis fly. This one has a square case made out of plant material it has a little hinge at the front end that it attaches to the rock with silk so that all six of its legs can face up into the water and grab particles moving by. So up close and personal with the uh, net spinning caddis fly case, this is about the, the size of the surface of my pinky finger. So that's about the size of the net that they spin um, for grabbing particles from the surface of the water. They have on their front end um, a structure called a labrum, which is like a lip structure. And that structure um, has a series of nozzles and with one swipe of their face across the net they can lay down several strands of silk at the same time to make this amazing net structure and again they're very territorial about it it's quite a lot of energy gone into that silk and the process of putting it all together so they're, they're quite territorial about defending their nets and they are cleaning the water for us um, every river has predators and this is one we mentioned before the, the dobson fly which turns it uh, you know there's my timer, stop. So um, I'm gonna pause for a second here and um, just check uh, if there are any, are there any questions in the chat right now? And do people uh, no, have no, questions? No, chance to throw them in there though. If folks have questions for Declan, uh, don't hesitate to put them in the, in the chat bar. And so what, I, what I'll do until questions come, I'll just keep showing you slides of cool bugs and tell you about them. And if, if any questions come, um, I'll stop. I have enough slides to go for another two hours. So I won't do that to you, I promise. Um, if no questions come before 8 o'clock, we'll stop at 8 o'clock one way or another. <laughs> we have a question. Oh, good. What's the question? Sanders asking, I commonly see very small two millimeter red swimming creatures in her marsh. Are these likely water mites? Uh, yes, very likely water mites. They kind of move like sonic hedgehog. They're all legs and all the legs are going at the same time. If you're not getting up close, you don't notice the legs though. So it looks like this smooth little red thing moving through the water. So yeah, those are definitely aquatic mites. Very cool little beasties. And another uh, from Mary Grace. Why do you need a flashlight with a microscope that already has a light on it? Um, if you're going to work at a picnic table and you can't plug it in. <laughs> that was an easy one. Thank you. Keep asking easy questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the flashlight is really handy for, for doing field work. But yeah, you can plug it in. You can plug those in. 
sometimes we get them um, cheap on eBay. We might get one for 40 bucks because it doesn't have any functioning lights. We'll buy it anyway because we're going to use it for on a picnic table. Um, the ones with the lights that are actually working usually end up in about $100, $120. So you can get a, a solid old microscope for, for not a ton of money. Um, you know, they're perfectly serviceable. <laughs> Another question from Patrick, has any correlation between species presence and climate been established? Um, you know, one, I, I, this came up recently in a discussion we were having. The difficulty with um, uh, species and climate in streams and, and lakes is most of the work is not being done at the species level. And so what we suspect will happen is there will be species that are distributed, let's say, let's say their distribution ends on the, border, the southern border of Vermont. As the climate warms, we'd expect them to start moving north. Problem is no one's going to notice because most people are identifying things to genus or to family. So the family is unlikely to get driven out of an area because some of those families extend from the southern tip of the end, you know, South America, all the way to north, northern Canada. So it's unlikely that a family is going to be, to be moved. It's, it's somewhat more likely that a genus might be moved. It's highly likely that a species might be moved but we would never know because we never identified them to species. Uh, to identify them to species, you need the adults and there aren't enough people being trained to identify things to, uh, at, at that level. And um, what might save us will be DNA work coming our way shortly. The genetic barcoding will be a way to identify things to species. And then we might be able to notice some of these patterns. So yeah, I do, things, do think things will be moving north. I don't think we'll notice. <laughs> it's a short answer. So, Can you give us a, um, a um, just a ballpark estimate of just within the families of uh, caddisflies, stoneflies, mayflies, how many species do you think there are present in our streams here in New England? <laughs> oh God, I, I would, I'd be a, hundreds, I, thousands, tens of thousands. Uh, certainly thousands, possibly tens of thousands. Yeah, yeah. I wish you had Steve Fisk on here. He'd give you a much more accurate number. Um, yeah, but yeah, I, I, would, I would say uh, tens of thousands. I think that's where we're heading. But, and if you start adding in things like mites, oh God, midges for God's sake. Yeah, definitely tens of thousands. I'm, you might get me to hundreds of thousands if I keep thinking about it long enough. But yeah, there's many, many, many species. And we won't know which ones are threatened or endangered because we haven't identified them all. And you can even describe new ones. Like in, in the... In, the most polluted site in Vermont. We've got two uh, sites in Vermont that are super fun sites that I know about. One of them is a barge canal in, in Burlington. They discovered two new species of um, springtails in that canal in, in the last dozen years. Like, you know, the skankiest water you could find in Vermont, there's two new species to be found. So if you start looking at small things, you'll find new species that are completely undescribed. One of them they named for Champ, and the other one, the name for Ross Bell, a famous entomologist who passed away in the last 18 months, in a Vermont entomologist, like the king of our entomologists, essentially. So yeah, those were recently discovered. So there's, yeah, there's lots, lots of diversity out there. I'm glad uh, Champ has been definitively identified now. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, one more question from uh, Becky, changing gears. Do you have any suggestions for the attachment point to a stick or a dowel for net making? That's always the weak point, she says. Yeah, I do actually. I, I suggest that you um, have your handle be a PVC pipe, okay? And then you've got that metal wire that's going to be your, your, uh, your net hoop, right? This stuff is rigid, right? Um, what you want is to take a dowel that's the right size to plug the opening of that PVC pipe. And you want to take this wire, slide it in next to the dowel. You can even bend the tip over and drill it into the side of the dowel and then hammer that dowel into the PVC pipe handle. And you've got yourself something that's really rugged. That's what I would suggest. Good question. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, that is all we have in the, in the hopper at the moment. All right. Uh, yeah. That, that, the fellow on screen there is a whirligig beetle larva. Um, the only thing that could possibly be confused with a, with a, with a Helgramite. <laughs> so there's a whirligig larva. You've seen the, the, the adults on top of a stream or a, a pond. The larvae are living underneath. What else have I got? Um, 
Oh yeah, I wanted to finish with dragonflies because everyone knows dragonflies. So this is a dragonfly nymph, okay? Um, <clears throat> the adults have those flat wings, right? Damselflies are sometimes confused with them. They're in the same group, Odonata. Damselflies hold their wings side by side. Dragonflies hold them out flat, okay? And both of those groups have something called a mask. And if you've ever heard the AT&T commercial, reach out and touch someone, it's no longer a, a, a current commercial, uh, they will crawl up close to something they're trying to get and then they will shoot that thing out really fast, grab hold of them and pull them back into their mouth. And that is how dragonfly uh, and damselfly larvae do their hunting. And the other cool thing about dragonfly larvae, which I should call nymphs, excuse me, they breathe out of their back end. So they will suck water into their rear end and squeeze it back out again. And if they need to get away in a hurry, it's their superpower because they can use it like a jetpack. They can shoot that water out super fast and they will move away really rapidly. And it's a cool thing to show, show uh, people, stick them in a basin of water and give them a little poke with a stick and you'll get to see them use jet propulsion. And I think I'll stop there. Um, you know, th th there's, there's so much more to learn. Uh, we can keep going as long as people want. I'll hang out and uh, people can turn on their microphones and I will answer questions more efficiently directly if you want to right now. Okay. And while I have, uh, thank you, Declan. And, and before we jump into questions and, and kind of uh, have our, our little uh, reception hour here, um, I just wanted to say a quick thanks again to Vermont EPSCOR and also all of our sponsors making naturalist journeys possible. Um, so our lead sponsor, Hunger Mountain Co-op, as well as Onion River Outdoors, Green Vest, Capital Copy, and Union Mutual. So thank you again, Declan. And uh, thank you. If folks would like to hang out and, and continue chatting and asking questions, feel free. And come next week to learn about fish from Doug Facey. Absolutely. Mm -hmm.